there are a lot of domestic things that we can do in our homes, on our porches, on our patios, on our roofs, and in our backyards that will not only you know give us nutrient density on site, but I think that there's just something spiritual about viscerally participating in something as intimate as food. You don't have to grow it all, and I'm not telling you to grow bananas in New York, but I am suggesting that there is something humbling and life-centering about touching something that's as intimate to us as our food. Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labradagor. This is episode 136, and my guest is Joel Salatin. Joel is a much admired farmer who has been a trailblazer for sustainable, regenerative agriculture. He runs Polyface Farm in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, and he was prominently featured in Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, and in the 2008 documentary, Food, Inc. He is a farmer, yes, but so much more. He is an advocate for real food and healthy living. He is a speaker and an author and a man who describes himself as a Christian, libertarian, environmentalist, capitalist, lunatic farmer. So yeah, that's Joel, an equal opportunity offender who challenges our conventional perspective, particularly when it comes to food and farming. Today, Joel tells us about his recent travels around the world. We learn about what's happening on the food and farming front in Australia, Austria, Spain, the Netherlands, and more. Along the way, he weighs in on imitation meat, how limited the organic label can be, and why Americans may be more willing to buck the government than Europeans are. And after going global with Joel, we get hyper-local. We swing back around to Polyface, his own farm, and then to our own backyards. How can we eat more locally? What changes can we make to live in a way that's better for the world and our health, too? Before we get into the conversation, we want to recognize our sponsors— First and foremost, this podcast is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation. We have our annual conference coming up. It's in Baltimore in November, the 16th to the 18th. And we want to see you there. Find out about all the amazing offerings at the conference, the speakers, the food, and more at wisetraditions.org. Also, I want to let you know that I'm going to be recording some live shows in California this July. I'm so excited, which is why I can't let another episode go by without telling you about it. Being a part of a live show recording is so fun. I did it last summer, and that's why I've signed up to do it again. So stay tuned for details about how to join us. I also hope to host a couple of spontaneous meetups out there in Cali. So do follow me at Holistic Hilda on Twitter, at Holistic underscore Hilda on Instagram, so that you can connect with me if you're out that way in July. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Joel. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Hilda. I should have said bienvenido because you just got back from Spain, right? Yes, I've just been in Australia, Spain, Austria, Netherlands, England, and Scotland. So wow. it's been quite a month. I would say so. So I'm glad we're starting with this discussion about the countries you've been in because I want to talk about the global farming scene. Let's start with Spain, actually. What did you notice when you were there in terms of trends and things you've noticed on the organic sustainable farms you visited? I think the most exciting thing for me, I had been there five years ago and done some seminars. And since that time, there's been some pretty neat activity in pastured livestock systems. And there were people there, you know, showing me pictures of here's my egg mobile and here's my grass, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's very gratifying. I was on an organic certified farm that was very disappointing and just illustrated once again how non-comprehensive the government term organic is now. Like this eggmobiles, you know, we went out and these were structures that get moved about once a year. They had 24 inches of chicken manure underneath, dirt yard, very unsanitary, stinky as could be, and he called them eggmobiles. So just because you call something something doesn't mean it is. So that's why the know your farmer, know your food thing is not just a trite saying, it's real. But the most interesting thing in Spain for me 
was there doing two days of classes. It's called a two-day master class. And toward the end, we're doing questions, and somebody says, well, how do you sell your eggmobile eggs when there's a rainstorm and they get wet? And I said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, in the EU, we can't sell washed eggs. If you have to wash them, you can't sell them. Now, in the U.S., basically, the health department says an unwashed egg is an unsaleable egg. Isn't that interesting? There, if it was dirty enough to have to wash it, you can't sell it legally. And here, every egg gets a nice chlorine fecal chicken poop batch. But anyway, I said, well, you know, what does wet have to do with it? Well, we can't sell washed eggs. I says, well, since when did wet become washing? And you could just see in the whole audience, oh, there were, you know, 140 farmers there. And you could just see the lights come on as they actually contemplated the legal nuance of the difference between washing and being wet. And in the European culture, they just don't have that rebellious streak like we have in the U.S. America was born in rugged individualism, distrust of government, and you know, I'll do it my way, Frank Sinatra, right? And those European countries, you just really see these cultural divides where they've grown up with kings and royalty and the benevolence of government and take care of me, and they don't have a little gene inside them almost that says, but wait a minute, can we find a loophole? They don't think like that. Their first thing is compliance. So then they had such a huge reaction over this thing. I said, well, good grief, we're on such a roll, sussing out the difference between wet and wash. How about if we suss out sale? What's a sale? Are there ways to move product that's not a sale? So I introduced them to CSAs, herd share, you know, the whole alternative economy independent buying club thing. They were pretty uh, agog over how this American was daring to wrestle with the legality of the regulation and what the actual criminal element is. And so that was very enlightening and telling of the difference in the cultures. You've said before that we ask for too much salvation by legislation. So you're used to kind of flouting the rules. And as you're saying, it sounds like not something that they're accustomed to doing over there necessarily. That's correct. There's plenty of people in the U.S. that bow and want to comply with everything. But it's more normal and common and to a higher degree, I think, in Europe. Then when I moved over to Austria, Austria and the Netherlands were quite interesting. Again, the first time I've been in Austria, it was my fifth trip to the Netherlands. And so I've gotten fairly familiar with Netherlands. But it really struck me this time in Austria, there is an antipathy in that whole kind of German, Austrian, Netherlands, that whole Central European area there that assumes that precision farming, that if you're going to farm precisely, and of course that's partly for efficiency, it all has to be mechanical. And so you don't see the Netherlands in Austria, you don't see grazing animals. Everything is in a building, even the organic certified, it's all factory farming in a building, even in the summertime. I was at an organic certified goat farm in Austria, 175 beautiful Thanen goats. Those goats have never eaten a green leaf. They've never set foot on soil. It's a completely confinement operation. Now, it's pretty, you know, it's nice, deep bedded, all concrete. You know, they have an apron that's kind of a shed thing that they can lounge in. And that satisfied the outdoor access for organic. But the whole paradigm there is if we let these animals graze, we can't handle things as precisely as you can with a mower and a rake and a baler. And that was kind of an epiphany for me on this trip to finally connect those dots and Mm -hmm. realize the bias that the whole culture. I mean, those Europeans are precise. The airports are fabulous. Goodness, they are a meticulously precise people, but making them move all to mechanical farming with chemicals and in confinement buildings, as opposed to the animals being out in portable infrastructure, portable shelters, moved around on grass. And so what I was able to bring to them was the precision that we can use with electric fencing, with portable infrastructure. And we can move this livestock around outside in a much more natural habitat, a much more sanitary, clean habitat. We can do that with every bit of precision you want. 
and it doesn't have to be all mechanically done. And that was kind of fun to watch the lights come on. So I was able to change some of my terminology to help to customize it and contextualize it to the situation. How did they respond to what you brought to the table? Sounds like they were pretty receptive, and it kind of maybe was an aha moment for some of them. They'll be more receptive when a few people start doing it, and they can actually (laughs) go somewhere and see it. There are numerous people now in Netherlands doing this, and so there are now some show-me places, and they're doing a great job. You know, the Netherlands is the world's second largest exporter of agricultural goods. And for such a tiny country, that's pretty amazing. But they do it on the basis of bringing in Brazilian and Paraguayan grains. Interestingly, they've just floated a deal where the government's spending $2 billion to dehydrate manure and send it by ship back to Paraguay and Brazil for fertilizer. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist very long to realize that you simply cannot have a regenerative, sustainable agriculture system when you are generating so much manure in a country that you have to dehydrate it and ship it across the Atlantic to a place of origin in order to keep your whole country from turning into a toilet bowl. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next 10 years. There's a referendum right now going, I think it's for 2020, that will require dairy farmers to only be able to have as many cows as they can feed with their own pasture forage or what they can produce on their own farm. If that actually goes through, it's going to really upset the dairy apple cart because right now I've met these guys. You've got how many cows are you milking? 100 cows. How much acres do you have? You know, I have 20 acres and it's all confinement, all confinement. And they just ship in feed and okay, so you can ship in the feed, but you're going to have all the manure is generated from the feed and that manure, is, there's just not enough country to metabolize it. Yeah, I wonder where this referendum came from. What was the impetus behind it? There is a massive environmental backlash in the Netherlands. People that are tired of all the canals now being too manure to drink or step in, you can actually smell it. So the canals are turning into sewers. And I watched as big liquid manure injection rigs were pulled out through fields And the science is in now. They realize that this injecting liquid manure into the soil, it might keep it from sitting on the soil, but it goes right into the groundwater and then into the canal. So there's a real environmental backlash. In fact, the one country where what I'm going to say was so apparent was Netherlands, and that is the whole fake meat thing, cultured meat, laboratory meat. There is a very much an urban backlash against the animal manure problem. And unfortunately, It's adding to the anti-animal sentiment, and it's not the animals, it's the greed. It's the greed of people that think that there are no ecological boundaries and you can overrun your nest anytime you want to, and nature doesn't have a balance sheet. Yeah, I've heard of this meat created in laboratories. I think they also call it just meat because it's just, you know, it's better for the planet and, you know, it lets the animals just be happy and we don't eat them. But I dare say that's not exactly what we in the natural food movement are looking for, nor do we think it's going to be the most nutrient-dense or even better for the animals or the planet, right? It won't be better for anything, and it certainly won't be better for our health, any better than hydrogenated vegetable oil was good for our health. But you know, this is the latest backlash, if you will, or response. I call it the pendulum swinging past balance to overcome the negativity of the factory farm system with animals. Of course, what all these folks need to do is instead of going to soy meat, what they need to do is purchase from a farmer who is not overrunning their ecology and who understands that there is a nest and there's a stewardship responsibility to that nest. Absolutely. Now, What did you notice when you were in Australia? Did you get to visit any organic or sustainable farms there, Joel? My takeaway of Australia, you know, a lot of the best regenerative agriculture systems have come out of Australia. I mean, you've got in the 50s, you had P.A. Yeomans with the whole key line system and water for every farm. And then you had Bill Mollison and Dave Holmgren developing permaculture came out of Australia. Now we've got Colin Seiss with pasture cropping has developed out of Australia. The whole region ag movement with Darren Dougherty, Lisa Heenan has come out of Australia. There's a lot of cool stuff. Peter Andrews, you know, he's the world guru on riverbank restoration out of Australia. And I think that the reason, what I like about Australia, it's a very fragile environment, arguably the most fragile in the world. 
so why are they developing all this stuff? Well, because necessity is the mother of invention. And so the fragility of the climate is pushing them to be innovative ecologically. And the difference between them and some other places like the Sahel or deserts around the world, the difference between Australia and the other areas that are very fragile is that Australia has the highest per capita income of any country in the world. It all floats on mining, you know, bauxite, aluminum, coal, it all gets shipped to China. I get that. But the point is that it is, in current terms, it is a very rich country. And so not only are they in a fragile ecosystem, but they actually have the capital resources, the wherewithal, to actually experiment some innovative responses. So, you know, Australia is such a cool place that way because a lot of the people that I follow have come out of Australia. So it's neat to see their permutations and also to be able to present these ideas and not have somebody look at you like, well, you know, I can't afford a piece of roofing. You actually do stuff. Coming up, Joel tells us about the wise traditions that he's incorporated into his own farming practices. And then he gives us some practical advice for changing the way we live and eat for the better. Now we want to pause and recognize our sponsors, the Weston A. Price Foundation. We are committed to helping you and the world eat better. Please come out and join us for our Wise Traditions Conference this fall in Baltimore, November 16th to the 18th. We will have all of the excellent speakers and food you have come to expect with some new tracks, like a cancer track, And then there's a cooking track and farming and a gut track and an aging gracefully track. (laughs) There's just so many speakers and sessions you can sit in on. It's really amazing. I can't get over all that is packed into this conference, not to mention the community and lifelong friendships that develop from it. So there's no time like the present. Register today. Go to wisetraditions.org to sign up. And if you do so by June 15th, you will save $75 off the full conference price. That's wisetraditions.org. Also, keep it on your radar that I'm coming out to California this July. I'm so excited. I'm going to be visiting farms and conducting interviews and even recording a couple of live shows while I'm out there. Details are still taking shape, so stay tuned. Follow me at holistic underscore Hilda on Instagram or at holistic Hilda on Twitter for updates on how to sign up for the events or just to join me for casual meetups. I love you guys and can't wait to see you soon. What wise traditions, if any, did you notice in Spain or in Austria? In other words, it's great for you to go and impart some wisdom and kind of get some responses that encourage people to look into how to do this regenerative, sustainable agriculture. But did you see anything that they were doing that made you go, oh, wow, made you kind of stop in your tracks? Like, this is something cool I hadn't thought of myself. In Austria, one of the coolest things is along the Danube River, those steep hillsides. I mean, they're so steep, you can hardly walk on them. And they're just tall. And those are all covered in vineyards, terraced vineyards. So you have like a five-foot, six-foot rock wall laid without concrete, no mortar, just rocks dry stacked as a retaining wall. And these terraces are only one vine wide. So imagine this mountainside where you've got a wall four or five feet high, a terrace four feet deep, another wall four or five feet high, another terrace four feet deep. And this just goes, I tried to count some of them, you know, there must be a hundred terraces, you know, up the side of the mountain and all that dry laid stone. And I'm just looking at that thinking, wow, here is something that one generation went, whatever, you know, a mile. Another generation went another mile. Another generation went another mile. And I mean, you're looking at centuries of landscape touching with a similar tradition. You know, they didn't switch the terraces from grapes to soybeans or soybeans to tomato plants. I mean, it's just been vineyard on those terraces for 500 years. And it's breathtaking. A lot of people in our culture today have not laid rock. I've made little walls, you know, out of rock. And the skill, the art, the craftsmanship of dry laid stone that works, the skill and the sheer effort to pick them up, place them in there and keep it from tumbling down. It just brings me to tears. I mean, it's just beyond anything. It's amazing. Oh, it sounds beautiful. And I was just thinking, wow, 
you could really appreciate it because you've built walls, like you said, but most of us would just look at it and take a picture and post it on Facebook, you know? <laughs> so yeah. I'm glad you could appreciate it. And, you know, I was recently at your farm and I have to admit, there were a lot of breathtaking moments for me right there. What do you see that's even happening? I'm going to bring it on home now. Jill, what do you see that's happening on your own farm that is like a take my breath away moment? On our own farm, a couple of the things that we're doing is the Colin Sice pasture cropping thing, which is a combination of holistic management, livestock grazing, using livestock, using herbivores as a way to temporarily weaken a perennial sod long enough to get an annual into it, whether that annual is wheat or barley or rye or corn or whatever it is, to get an annual in it. That's a breakthrough. I mean, that's a real significant breakthrough. The other thing that we're doing is the, again, borrowing from other people is the New Zealand K-line irrigation system. You know, when you're in pasture production, both of these things, uh, irrigation and pasture cropping, are both techniques to create forage chains. There's no place in the world where there aren't peaks and valleys in the forage growing curve. You know, in the Mediterranean climate, you have six months of water, six months of dry. So it doesn't get cold, doesn't get snowy, but you get the dry and the wet. Mm -hmm. And the grass doesn't grow in the dry, it grows in the wet. So that's the Mediterranean problem. In our area, the problem is generally at least one drought a year, sometime either spring or fall, and then you have a winter dormancy with snow. Of course, that's all the way up through North America, you know, into Canada. Every part of the world has what we call forage peaks and valleys. And so when you're doing grass-based animals, what you're trying to do is create consistent nutrition, the nutrition being a component of obviously proteins and carbohydrates in the forage, but a constant state of nutrition through the season when it's hot or cold or dry or wet, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so the pasture cropping system and the irrigation system from New Zealand, the K-line system, are both schemes to try to overcome some of those peaks and valleys. When I was just in Austria, I saw another option, which Lewis Bromfield was doing back in the 1940s, where he was using a box to dry hay so he could cut grass, put it in a box, pump warm air through it, and dry it down, and he could actually store uh, pasture-quality hay in a dry state without a vacuum like silage. Silage is, is problematic in, in herbivores uh, because it makes acidosis in the, in the rumen, changes the pH, and you can't make good yogurt or kefir or cheese or anything with silage-based dairy. And so there's a huge amount. Well, in Austria, they do so much craft cheese. I mean, craft C, not hay. <laughs> <laughs> they do so much artisanal cheese in Austria that now for several decades, they've actually paid a premium price for milk that's from a cow that's never had silage. Oh. And so they've perfected these cool systems. So I was able to see some of them and I think we're probably going to at least dabble around with them a little bit. You know, they have all this cool equipment to make it easy. We don't have that equipment in the U.S. here. But dairies that are interested in really being on the cutting edge need to look at this. It's basically like raisin, you know, raisins, except it's grass, not grapes. Well, I think some of our listeners are homesteaders and small farmers and probably big farmers who will understand all these nuances that you're describing. But for those of us that live in cities or in houses in the suburbs, what can we do, Joel, to start growing or raising our own food? What would you recommend for beginners? I think one of the easiest things is <laughs> I'm a big fan of a couple of chickens, but bigger picture, I would say just do something for yourself and just touch the magic, the awesome world of the living world. I mean, there are neat little uh, hanging pipes with pockets in them that you can have your own herb garden hanging on the corner of your patio. You can have plants in pots. Uh, you can put honeybees on the roof of your house. If you've got any room at all, you can, of course, you know, have a garden. You can have some rabbits, some chickens. Feed the kitchen scraps to the chickens. The chickens will turn those into eggs. You have a vermicomposting bin for earthworms under your kitchen sink instead of sending stuff down a disposal or out to the curb to go to the landfill. 
put it through worms, and then the worm castings can be your house plant fertilizer, things like that. And so there are a lot of domestic scale things that we can do in our homes, on our porches, on our patios, on our roofs, and in our uh, backyards that will not only you know give us nutrient density on site, but I think that there's just something spiritual about viscerally participating in something as intimate as food. You don't have to grow it all, and I'm not telling you to grow bananas in New York, but I am suggesting that there is something humbling and life-centering about touching something that's as intimate to us as our food. Absolutely. I was just walking with a friend this morning and we were talking about that very thing that I think St. Augustine said, God has two words for us, the Bible and nature. (laughs) There's something very beautiful and holy and life-giving in it, isn't there? Yes, there is. Well, anyone who knows me knows that I routinely, I mean, I wrote a book, The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs, and the whole thesis is that nature is an object lesson of spiritual truth. Mm. So what we want is for people to come and visit the farm, and when they exit, when they drive out the lane, we want them to say, oh, that's what abundance looks like. Oh, that's what forgiveness looks like. Oh, that's what neighborliness looks like. To see these great big spiritual concepts, to see them materialize so we have a skeleton to hang our theory on, you know, that's a very powerful framework and a profound goal, I think. Is this one reason why you call your kind of farming beyond organic? Well, the problem is that the reason that our farm is not certified organic is because there are numerous issues with organic. I mean, one is you have to have very hot compost, and we don't want real hot compost. We want a more cool uh, biodynamic type compost. So these things get kind of squirrely out on the edges. And of course, you know, 95% of all the organic eggs and chicken and stuff in the country is just factory farmed. They just use organic feed. And one of the problems there is, of course, a lot of the feeds being imported. And anyone who's been watching the news knows about the great big scam through Turkey last year that the Washington Post uncovered where these ships carrying grain from, I think they were from China, docked in Turkey, and the papers were just conventional stuff, and they stamped it organic and imported it to U.S. as organic grain. And so, you know, there's, uh, again, there's, there's, no, there's no substitute for turning off the TV, you know, don't go to the movies this year, and take that recreational entertainment budget of time and money and invest it in finding your local integrity farmer. You won't get everything that way, but if you can get the lion's share of your food from your local integrity farmer, um, it, it, it'll do wonders for you. And many of these local farmers are looking for just, you know, if I just had 10 more customers, if I just had 15 more customers, they're at a close tipping point to be able to leave their town job and farm full time And so you can be an enabler to tip them over that edge and let them quit that town job and that commute, stay on the farm, and you can be that facilitator. What a great, you know, what a great calling. Absolutely. I'm thinking for those who can't quite imagine putting a, you know, beehive up on their roof or or getting a couple chickens, maybe just getting to know their farmer and starting that way um, can be a way to nourish their families and to change their lives, really. So as we start to wrap up, Joel, I have two final questions I want to ask you. A friend of mine on Instagram said, oh, please pose this question to Joel. So I am. What do you do to maintain your focus and energy? Because you've been going strong for some time now. So, well, I eat well. I have a great family, a great team here. We put a lot of emphasis here on relationship and this is a people centric farm. And so every day I get to go out, you know, there's 25 of us who live here on the farm and I get to watch these folks drink my (laughs) (laughs) Kool-Aid. And there's something pretty cool about watching people get excited about healing the land. Our moniker is healing the land one bite at a time to connect the, you know, the menu with what the landscape will look like that our children will inherit. 
And we believe that very strongly, that the stewardship thing is real. It's not just an academic discussion. It's not just something you talk about in focus group. It's real. And whatever we see that we maybe would like to change in our society, in our culture, in our air, soil, water, well, you know, those changes are not going to come by us sitting around telling other people what to do. They come by us doing what we're supposed to do and being the change agent that we want to see. And so, you know, what fires me up is seeing the land heal. I mean, to walk out the back door and immerse myself daily, a participatory, visceral healing process is just, it's intoxicating. Absolutely. It sounds extremely satisfying and beautiful. So I want to ask you now the question I often pose at the end of the show. Joel, if the listener could just do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend that they do? One thing, get in your kitchen. And when I say get in your kitchen, you know, a lot of people start rolling their eyes. Oh, I don't have time to, you know, like, like remember that old uh, commercial? I remember what it was where the guy's got two telephones and a third one's ringing. He says, cut down on sugar. I don't have time to cut down on sugar, you know. And yet this is just one of the most simple, profound ideas there is. What we have is the culmination of billions and billions of decisions that have been made. And where we're going to be in 20 or 30 years is also going to be a manifestation of the billions and billions of decisions that are made between now and then. And so when you get in your kitchen to use your own domestic culinary arts to prepare, preserve, package, and process food, you begin noticing nuances, you notice texture, you notice smell, and you develop a skill level. And the truth is that as a culture, you simply cannot divorce yourself as profoundly as our culture has from the fuel for our bodies and expect integrity to remain. You can't extricate yourself from the process as profoundly as we have and expect accountability to happen. And so if we're going to actually move to a place of food understanding and food skill and food integrity, the system can only be as good as the knowledge that people have about the system. And there's nothing that beats the knowledge and the nuances of actually being in your kitchen. Men can cook, women can cook. It's just a recognition that you simply can't subcontract and farm out your body's fuel. You simply can't farm it out to Tyson, even though they say feeding you like family. With family like that, who needs enemies, right? Uh Um, You cannot farm all of this out and expect wise choices to happen. Wise traditions starts with a home-centric, kitchen-centric type of of experience. And we now have timed bake, we have hot and cold running water, we have, Mm. you know, uh, ovens, you know, Instapots, and slow cookers, ice cream makers, bread makers, I mean, we got Cuisinarts, chop, dice, you know, do everything, but goodness, comb your hair, right? (laughs) I mean, this is not grandma's kitchen. When I say get in your kitchen, I'm talking about the most techno-gadgetized room of the house. Discover it, enjoy it, immerse in it, and enjoy building your nest. Well, thank you so much, Joel. We are going to ruminate on that. Those are wise words to end with. We are so grateful that you took the time today. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. My guest today was Joel Salatin. To connect with Joel, go to polyfacefarms.com. Also, he has a new blog that you can find at thelunaticfarmer.com. For the show notes and highlights from today's episode with links to resources we mentioned, go to our website, westonaprice.org, and look for the show notes for episode 136. And if you're enjoying this podcast, by the way, just go ahead and subscribe through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a thing. And don't forget to stay connected with us via social media. We are at Weston A. Price on Twitter and Instagram. And look for the Weston A. Price Foundation on Facebook. Next week, everybody, we get to hear from Sean Sherman, the sous chef. I mean, really the sous chef, S-I-O-U-X. He is revitalizing Native American cuisine. He is a remarkable man with an amazing mission. He and his team are dedicated to lifting up the long lost food ways of his people. 
It's a fascinating conversation that will challenge the way you look at the United States and Native American history and culture, and will also challenge the way you look at your own food sources and habits. Before I wrap up, I want to thank my friends at Podcast Village for their support in getting the show out week after week, and the Wise Traditions team of interns, Cynthia Castro Cohen Enriquez, Joy de los Santos, Amy Marvin, Deirdre Beard, Daiva Rizvi, Melanie Ahern, Mary Hine, and Olga de Villiers. Thanks also to the listening team that includes Victor Cosetto and Heather Carpentier. And last but not least, please visit the podcast page on the westonaprice.org website. There's a super brief survey for podcast listeners there. We want to find out more about who you are so we can keep delivering the content that means the most to you. I promise you it'll only take a minute or so to fill out. Thanks for helping us out in advance. And keep listening, everybody. Thanks for listening today. Our website, westonaprice.org, offers free resources to address your questions and support your journey to health. You'll find videos, articles, and brochures covering a broad variety of health topics. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.